Remember the place where Jesus went into the synagogue and they handed him the scroll. And it said, when he had found the place in Isaiah where it said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's what that represents. I want to talk today about some kingdom foundations. But rather than be really, really specific about what those foundations are, what I want you to get from today is that the kingdom is the foundation of all of Christianity. We would say it would be love or forgiveness or you might say salvation or you might have any other terminology. But in reality, what did Jesus preach? He came preaching the kingdom of God. So if Jesus preached the kingdom... I guess maybe we should. We preach a lot of things. We don't necessarily preach much about the kingdom. And of course, preaching about the kingdom implies naturally there's a king. So try to leave the obvious, maybe unsaid. I don't try to make a huge point of, of the obvious. I don't want to insult your intelligence. But the kingdom is more than just a component of our faith. It's the very foundation. It's the crucial uh, every part, it's integrated so, so deeply. You, you can't talk about any facet of the Christian life without it being uh, necessary for you to have an understanding that we're in the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, I was thinking on the way to church today, and, and, and I think I'll cover this at the end, but the reason Jesus said repent is that you're not fit for the kingdom in your present condition. You don't think right. You don't have the right heart. You don't have the right attitude. You're twisted and warped and full of self and pride and unteachableness and arrogance and on and on and on it goes until we come face to face with the Savior who said, I own you. Who do you think you are? What are you doing? I made you. I own you. You don't get to make it up. You don't get to do your own thing. You don't get to do you. you we're raised in a culture that says, you can do whatever you want. You can be whatever you want to be. Well, in a sense, that's true. But in a limited degree. We are owned by God. He bought us with the precious, sinless blood of the Savior. You don't belong to you. You still get to make decisions, but it's all in light of the kingdom that you're a part of. It's so huge. I've been thinking the last few weeks, I don't know how I went this long without preaching a lot about the kingdom. I mean, I had an understanding, but I haven't been specific. And as I mentioned at the beginning of whenever I started this a month ago or whenever it was, um, I was spurred by kingdom thought, and, and Pam could tell you this. I came home from uh, Bible college that night thinking, I can't do this. There's no way I can write a, a paper on the kingdom of God. I'd still have been writing, and it's 20 years ago. The kingdom of God is monstrous. It's huge. 
Anyway, let's read Matthew 9, starting at verse 35. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, Jesus not only had a distinct message, the good news of the kingdom, but also a distinct ministry, which illustrated the message. When he healed every disease and every sickness, he was demonstrating his message of the kingdom. The kingdom is here. The kingdom of God is here. And it's going to eradicate the effects of sin. And I'm going to demonstrate how. So what he spoke and what he did were supporting one another. So everything Jesus did supported everything Jesus said. What he said was the kingdom of God is at hand. The rule and reign of God has come into this world in fierce opposition to the ruler of this world. And he was declaring that he was the anointed one of God. The Jews call it the Messiah, the anointed one, to destroy this ultimate power that this world was exhibiting where Satan was ruling and he had uh, death and sickness and poverty and disease and all this stuff. Those are the earmarks of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus said, no. He spoke a little French and said, au contraire. Okay, I made that part up. (laughs) But what he said was, this ain't happening. ain't happening. So what he did said the kingdom of God is at hand. He walked on water. He calmed the storms. He multiplied food. He set the oppressed free. He healed the sick, he raised the dead, and all the other things that he did said the kingdom of God is here. It's at hand right now. This proclamation was like a sledgehammer to the face of the demonic hordes and Satan himself. He said, you're not going to rule here anymore. This is over with. This counterfeit kingdom you've been ruling since the fall of man. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalm 24, I think it is. Said, uh, I'm reclaiming that. So right from the beginning, from when Jesus was baptized, the battle line was drawn, and uh, Jesus was sent to the desert. Remember that, to do battle with Satan? Forty days without food or water. And by that, Jesus made his point. He was serious. And I've never seen that in the scriptures before. I've never seen it from that angle. I've just always told the story. He goes and does battle with the devil 40 days and 40 nights. But I never viewed it as a, as a statement of, I'm serious about this. I'm serious. I, I think too often believers think they can walk in the glory or the presence or the power of the Spirit of God without making a sacrifice, without living a life of separation. You can't read through the Old Testament and not come to the conclusion that those who moved in the ministry of the things of God were a separated people. And Peter says we are a holy priesthood. How is it that the church of today can believe you can be just like the world? Talk like them, have their same values, and you're not like them. You want to be like them, but you're not like them? How does that work? If you've been redeemed and set apart, why is it then you're just like the culture we live in? That's rhetorical. (laughs) You can't. So I'm just saying, the old-time preachers, when they say they preached hellfire and brimstone, what they were saying was, you can't live like that. That life is dead. That life is gone. You're living a new life now. And I just think we're, so, we're trying so hard to please everybody. We just want to water it down. and you Just come at your own speed. No. No, it's all or nothing. 
Sorry. It's all or nothing. It's full speed ahead or get off the tracks because you're going to get run over. Mark 1. One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. And he was among the wild animals and angels took care of him. Uh, I just want to assure you that whatever you face, God's got you. He's got your back. If necessary, the angels will take care of you. If the Spirit of God drives you to a place of confrontation with darkness, don't worry about it. God will take care of you. I don't know if you've ever felt like you were doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan. There have been a few occasions in my life where I really sensed the spirit of darkness. A few. Some of you have had your own personal battles. But I want to assure you, God does not fail anybody. He does not leave you as an orphan. He does not send you out on your own. When you're on assignment, God's got forces that back you up. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Well, that's the declaration, and what follows is the demonstration in the next few verses. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of it. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this, they asked. It's got to be. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. Now, before Jesus showed up, you could walk through Capernaum or Galilee and see a person possessed of a demon, and there would be nothing anybody could do about it. It was pretty commonplace. Nobody could help them. But when the demon said, I know who you are, you holy one of God, he was the only one who understood what was really happening right then. Just as an aside, sometimes the devil tells the truth. In order to foster a bigger lie. I know the devil's a liar, the father of lies, a liar from the beginning, on and on and on. I understand that. But there are times he must tell the truth. Jesus, uh, what was the occasion? Oh, he said, what's your name? He made him tell Jesus his name. He said, we are legion, for we are many. I think it was the guy with the pigs, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So there are times when the devil has to tell the truth. But in this case, all the religious people were missing who Jesus was. And the demons understood it. That's why Jesus said, shut up. It's not time for you to be blabbing that right now. There will be time enough for that. And then the demon said, have you come to destroy us? Well, he knew the answer. That's why he asked the question. They know their end and what it is. And they're desperately trying to outrun it. But Jesus, in 1 John 3, 8, we, write, we read this that was written in the scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the Son of God came to play footsies with the devil. <laughs> but the Son of God came that he might not irritate the devil too much. But the Son of God came to have detente 
with the devil. No. The Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus, by all he said and by all he did, was making a declaration of war against the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of God was invading space that rightly belonged to God. God made the whole world and everything in it and saw that it was good. And then Ab and Eve went south. They fell. It's what's called the fall. We, have to, we can only preach about this in September and October. Okay, I made that up too. But when God made everything, it was peace and health and beauty and wonderful and good. And then Adam and Eve fall and you have murder, you have sickness, you have disease, you got death. We've all been born into a kingdom of rebellion against God. And we're subject to its rulers. By our natural inclination, we're all defiant. Don't tell me what to do. From little. My do it. It's just in us. Well, unless you're preacher's kids, then you're perfect. Not. But the rulers of this world express their... Um, their natural inclination of rebellion against God. They express it through us, their subjects. Ephesians 6, 12, you know this well, but let me read it again slowly. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. In other words, our war isn't with people. Even though people are the agency through whom evil manifests itself. The true battle is spiritual against the forces that are influencing those people. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Let me pause there. If you had the spiritual eye and could see, I believe what you would see above us is a hierarchy of spiritual rule that's demonic in nature, influencing people, kingdoms, nations, governments, the world. Layers of evil. We get an inside peek at that in the story in Daniel when he prayed for 21 days. When Michael the archangel showed up and says, well, I was doing battle with the prince of Persia. Just in case you wonder about what the religion who worships Allah thinks and how God views it. The prince of Persia, Persia, Iran. Demonic. Ooh, that's not inclusive. Yeah, it includes all of them. No? Anyone? That, that was missed by everybody? Inclusive? Come on. Our culture wants us to be inclusive? Never mind. If I have to explain it, it's too much work. <laughs> so the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places there's a hierarchy of demonic rule that you and I have a shield against. That's why our armor in Ephesians 6 is so vital that you and I can withstand their attacks. We are not influenced, or we don't have to be influenced by them. We have power greater than theirs against them. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Oh, you only want to do part? Well, then you're probably not going to stand. Have to do all. All of what? All that's necessary. Praying, studying the scriptures, 
surrendering to God, walking in his ways, walking as a kingdom person with kingdom understanding. Do all that you may stand. Otherwise you will, duh, fall. So the war of the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness will continue until, as I mentioned last week, Revelation 11:15. The kingdoms of this world will have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So there's a war going on, and you and I are in it. This war is ours to fight. You and me, we get to fight it. Well, how do you fight a war? Well, it's a spiritual war. You fight with spiritual tools. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Through the pulling down of strongholds. It means how you think. Don't allow uh, a demonic idea to build a fortress in your mind where you cannot be uh, dissuaded from the, di- from the uh, incorrect belief and persuaded to the truth. And that's the battle that goes on when you're confronted by the Word of God. The things that you've always thought your belief system, the structures of uh, your, your paradigms, how you viewed the world, the church, salvation, Christianity, you, life, God, Jesus, all that. The way you have viewed that must align with God's word. And if you don't tear down those strongholds that are contrary to the word of God and make every thought captive to Christ, you will be in error. You will fall. Confrontational, isn't it? Remember, your battle isn't with me. My battle's not with you. But the ideas that we adopt that are inconsistent with God's word, they're demonic. First Timothy chapter four. In the last days, some will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. So we need to know the word. Our warfare is spiritual in nature, but it has spiritual and natural world results. When we are at peace, it's pretty hard for somebody to get you mad. I'm not saying you should never be angry. Just be be angry at the right things and in the right way. I'm really upset by the evil in this world. I'm, I'm bothered by that the fact that we have many, many people who are on the streets living, begging. But their value system, what they value most is drugs, mm-hmm. alcohol, rebellion. Uh, they call it freedom. Live my own life, my own way, my own terms. It's defiance. That, by the way, that's the whole thing with this gender thing. God obviously made a mistake. Right. <laughs> Hadn't thought of that. Good one. <laughs> it's just defiance. I'm not... I, I, I mean, after all, I'm seven. I can think what I want. You ever dealt with a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, a ten-year-old? I've got an almost 10 year old granddaughter. Who do they think they are to have their own ideas? <laughs> it is 2411 Psalm. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. So when Jesus came and died on the cross, he, he was like driving a stake in the ground. That cross said, I'm reclaiming what God says is his. I'm taking it back. This is mine. It's finished. The eventual victory is coming. Um, God's anointed one is going to deal a death blow to Satan. All of his hordes. They know who he is. They know what his mission is. Sadly, many believers do not. So the birth of the church in the book of Acts at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came with power and I'm going to use this word. The church was endued with power. It means infused, baptized. The Holy Spirit came to give power to the church to enforce the kingdom rule in the dark ages in which the church lives. 
we can invoke our spiritual kingdom authority at God's prompting. Remember the word unction? The Holy Spirit can release in us a direction and the power to use that for His glory. I'm always amused by those who claim to be apostles or claim to uh, be divine healers. And when I say amused, I mean irritated. <laughs> I should speak more plainly, huh? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> if God moves through you from time to time to heal somebody, he gets the glory. Don't print a business card saying, Hi, I'm Billy Bob the healer. No. The early disciples understood the ministry of Jesus was to destroy the works of darkness, declared the kingdom of God had come, declare the light. And uh, their message and ministry was just like the ministry and message of Jesus. Come to the darkness, invade it with the light of the kingdom of God. Rebuild kingdom foundations for the church to grow and build on. Paul and the New Testament church understood this. In my lifetime, I've seen the church shift from being soul winning and confrontational to being um, a church that wants to present the gospel in a comfortable way, in an acceptable way, so that we could avoid rejection, persecution, confrontation, be at peace, and just be um, everybody's good friend. We're supposed to confront the culture in which we live, and we seldom do that. Why? Well, because, one, it takes some oomph. You need to know what you speak about. If Christ lives in you and his power resides in you and ministers through you, why wouldn't you want to release that and help somebody else find a way out of the darkness? It isn't just us four no more. Let me give you a short history lesson and we wrap this up. Now, how many of you were alive during World War II? Then you know D-Day was June 6, 1944. You were there? No. The Allied forces had invaded Normandy, broke the back of the enemy, broke through, and it ensured our total victory and the Nazis' defeat. But this war lingered on for almost a year, even though the Nazis knew they were defeated. It wasn't until V-Day, Victory Day, May 7, 1945. So from June 6 to May 7, that's 11 months, the peace treaty was actually signed May 7, 1945. Sadly, more people were killed during that 11 months than any other period of the war. The Nazis knew they were defeated, and more people were killed during that span of time, even though they, they knew it was over. We are living in the period between the inauguration of the kingdom and the consummation of the kingdom. While we do have total victory, we know it's coming. We can understand why the ruler of this world continues to reap havoc at an accelerated rate of speed. He knows his time is short. Uh, the Bible says in the last days, wickedness and evil will increase. People will be deceived and deceiving. I think the King James says, deceiving and being deceived. And boy, we're certainly there. That's why our understanding of the kingdom matters. Um, you know, I've spoken a lot about the already and the not yet. So we pray for somebody to be healed. They get healed. That's an expression of the already here kingdom. But we pray for somebody and they don't get healed. It's probably because there's also an element of the not yet kingdom in play. God's doing something else right now. He's either character development or maybe he wants to deal with them about a lifestyle change or maybe sin in their life or who knows. God has something else going on. So we pray for people, they get healed, boom, it's kingdom enforcement, hallelujah. 
We pray for somebody they don't get healed. Don't be discouraged. God has something else going on. The kingdom is still here. It's just not here in fullness yet. We still pray for the sick. People still get healed. Just like we still pray for people to get saved, and people do get saved. They have glorious conversions. Repent of sin. Lifestyle change. Change of mind. All that still happens in people today. The gospel is still effective. I was in a funeral service on Friday at the, at, I won't tell you the name of the church, a Lutheran church. The man spoke the truth about the gospel. The only thing that concerned me was that he put the man in heaven based on his baptism. I'm not sure they understand the terminology for salvation. It's, it's amazing how many people don't. But in the book of Romans, it says we must confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. For it's with the mouth that you confess and with the heart that you believe. If you don't believe and confess with your mouth, I'm sorry. All the good deeds in the world don't matter. I mean, it's nice. I won't get you to heaven. You've got to go through Jesus. Baptism is just water. Unless it's an element of faith where you're declaring openly, I am buried with Christ. I am raised to new life in him. And this is the physical, visible, outward demonstration of my faith in Jesus and his death and resurrection. That's for me. I have that new life now, and I will come out of the grave as he did later if I live that long. I'm thinking maybe we're going to see the rapture. I'm not sure. I'm kind of leaning that way. So our understanding of kingdom matters. So anyone who gives their life to Jesus can come out from under Satan's rule and into a relationship with Jesus, walking in the power and authority of the Holy Spirit. So this message of the kingdom that God has come to bring us out of Satan's rule, um, that's why Jesus came preaching. And when he said, you've got to repent, which I referenced earlier, we've got to repent and believe. So if God is king, then we need to honor him as king. We need to submit to his authority. It's not complicated, is it? Just because it isn't complicated doesn't mean it's easy. Because the struggle isn't about the complication. The struggle is about your pride. What we want. There's the struggle. It's quite simplistic. A child can receive Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus said, if you don't become as a child, you, you're not going to have any part in the kingdom. He didn't mean anything other than you need to be simple about this. This isn't complex. Just believe. Believe and accept. I am the Savior. And he came to be your Savior. So I just thought, well, Jesus is always telling people what the kingdom is and what it's like. We should do the same. We should be declaring and demonstrating what the kingdom is and what it is like. So when you live your life of surrender to God and you walk with Jesus, you are demonstrating what it's like to be under kingdom rule. I belong to Jesus. I'm a willing subject of the kingdom of God. I don't have those values any longer. So you see somebody that's all bound up, you can say, you know, you remind me of me. This is who I used to be. I'm not saying I'm better than you. I'm just saying that once I thought like you thought. Once I was just like you. Let me tell you how I got free. Let me tell you how my life changed. It's your and my calling to be an authentic kingdom living person and represent that accurately in Fresno County. It's our job. Now, when you live like a kingdom person, it will elicit a response. God's desire is to walk with us like he did with Adam and Eve. So I'm just a couple of questions and then we're out. Is your life in any kind of bondage? Are you living under any kind of darkness? Are your values the values of the world or the values of the kingdom? Is fear, shame, brokenness, anger your life? You want to be free? 
That's the offer. Would you like to be free? It's quite simple. Just bow with me, would you? Now, if at any point something in you is quickened, I'm going to use the word triggered because it's so used in our culture today, but I don't mean triggered as in made angry. I mean triggered as in heightened your sensitivity. Perhaps the fleeting thought came and then you dismissed it, but it said, maybe there's a change for you that God wants to do something in your life. Lord, I would ask right now by the power of your spirit that you would come to whomever in this room or whomever is watching, that somehow by your sweet, gentle spirit, you would call them to yourself and impress upon them how much you love them and how the wonderful change that's available is so freely given and easy to receive. Lord, today would you come as we confess our need and cleanse us. And it doesn't hurt any of us ever to say, Lord, I I just confess my great need of you. I acknowledge, Lord, without you I'm nothing. I'm hopeless, but because of you, I have the hope of salvation, the hope of the resurrection, the hope of the rapture, the blessed hope, the return of our Lord and heaven forever with you and all the saints and loved ones who have gone before. Lord, that hope is mine because of you. And Lord, without you, I don't get any of that. No wonder the world is depressed and suicide is rampant. No wonder they're hopeless. Lord, help us today to see the simplicity of the gospel. The gospel is at hand. It's right here. Just repent. Be willing to change your mind and believe what Jesus said. Lord, thank you for your great mercy. How you've lingered with us. How on several occasions, Lord, I'm sure each of us can think of times when we probably should not even still be here. But your mercy has granted us one more opportunity to repent. Lord, thank you for your kindness. We bless you today. Now may your word and your kingdom be large in your people. May we continue to offer hope and help to all who need it. And the power and strength of your name. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen.